Hi, everyone. Thank you guys so much for joining our quarterly webinar. Today, I'm so excited to have Dr. Belinda Hammond share this amazing uh, topic. It relates to DEI and how schools can really help students think outside the box and be innovative. Um, so with that being said, I'm going to hand it over to you, Dr. Hammond. Um, and we're so excited for your amazing talk today. Well, thank you so much. And it's wonderful to be here. Um, today, we'll be talking about just thinking out of the box and removing student barriers to clinical experiences. I am being joined by some of the most incredible uh, clinical leaders um, who have created some really fabulous programs to help students uh, remove barriers to accessing clinical experiences. Um, I can do a quick introduction. I know we have Katrina here, and I saw Ashley a moment ago, and I'm hoping she... There we go. So we have both of them here. Heidi is not able to join us, but she did send me some information to be able to share with you on her program. So I'm going to do a better introduction of everybody in just a few moments. But I want to first talk about the need for being able to think outside of the box and the need for students to be able to access clinical experiences. Oops, and now that I've changed all of my settings, let's see if I can figure out how to advance the slide. There we go. Oops, except I advanced too far. There we go. So a little bit of information on me. Um, I am currently a senior lecturer at Eastern Washington University. I'm also the founder of Child Life Connection. And while that's kind of a smaller agency that I do more consulting work, most of the folks in this field are familiar with Child Life Connection Student Forum. Um, there is a huge need for student resources and community, and that's what that page serves. I have also discovered my passion for academic program development. I love being here at UCSB because this is my first time back in about five years, but I created this program um, about 11 years ago. So I love that this program is still just doing such a beautiful job in providing academic programming for students. So thank you for having me back. Um, I've also developed the, or co-developed the programs at American Public University and Eastern Washington University. And as a result of a virtual practicum that I hosted at the very beginning of the pandemic, I was talking to one of my students who was participating, and she was saying how much she really wanted to complete her, her requirements for child life certification through an HBCU, which is a historically Black college and university, but there were none that offered child life programs. And that was the first time I had ever really thought about HBCUs as needing to have programming in child life. And so I started exploring both HBCUs and HSIs, which are Hispanic serving institutions. And so far I have two that are up and running, uh, both in California, in Sonoma and San Francisco. And those both started in fall of 2022. Uh, we have Bowie State in Maryland that will be starting in spring of 2025. So our first HB HBCU will be coming along very soon. And then we have one additional HSI in California at Channel Islands that will be starting in fall of 2026. So I'm really excited about that. And I'm hoping that this impacts diversity in our field. But just finding the communities where students are, for me, is the most important piece. But also looking at what is preventing students from being able to move forward and figuring out how do we mitigate those barriers is a, a really big part of that as well. So the purpose of today's presentation is to gain greater understanding into the impact of diversity, equity, and inclusion in the field of child life. We will be focusing on exploring how we as a field can help to overcome student, uh, the, the barriers that students are facing when trying to complete not only the academic requirements, but the clinical requirements. And those have changed about 10 years ago. There was really no such thing as a practicum. And now we have students relocating two to three times uh, throughout their clinical requirements, just trying to get those requirements wherever they may be. And so we know that students are, are relocating quite a bit. My hope is also that we can brainstorm some ways that we can minimize the barriers that students are facing, whether it's as a result of culture, race, age, or physical limitations. There are students out there who will make incredible child life specialists and bring a wealth of knowledge and experience, but the barriers are simply preventing them from moving forward. Now, this is one of my personal favorite slides because these are my kids having real medical experiences in our local hospital that without me does not have child life. I was there for my kids, but they swear they don't see pediatric patients. As you can see, they do. But the purpose of child life is to reduce the negative impact of stressful or traumatic life events. 
and the situations that affect development, health, and well-being of infants, children, youth, and families. Now, I say that because we know that normalization for children is really the most one of the most important things that we can do as child life specialists. Yet normal to me is based on my culture, my background, my language, everything that is me. And what we're seeing is that my lived experiences may not be normalizing to every child from different backgrounds and cultures. And so that's one of the biggest reasons why DEI is such an important focus, that we really can't do justice for all of the kids and families that come through our programs if we are not representing those same children and families by having specialists that look the same, that speak the language, that have those shared experiences and backgrounds. Now, this part, I know everybody knows what I'm going to talk about ACLP really quickly. Their mission is to foster excellence in child life professionals through engagement in education, scientific inquiry, and motivation or innovation. Sorry. Um, their vision is for children and families of every race, identity, and community understand, navigate, and cope with serious life events. We know that because of the lack of uh, equity, inclusion, collaboration, the lack of representation, we probably are missing in being able to achieve this vision and these values simply because the diversity is really lacking in our field. Ah, and it's still not working the way it's supposed to. Bear with me for one moment. There we go. So what is diversity, equity, and inclusion? Diversity is the representation of all of our varied individuals and collective identities and differences. We know that we have incredibly diverse students, but for whatever reason, the diverse students aren't, aren't completing all of the requirements to enter the field. And we know that there are barriers preventing that. What we also know is that in terms of equity, equitable opportunities, that students are not all in a position to relocate. Not stu students aren't all in a position to fund four months of unpaid work. There are a lot of issues in terms of what is equitable and if a student from a diverse background can't accommodate childcare for young children, or they can't accommodate un unpaid work, they can't accommodate relocating. And some students don't even have a child life program that is a drivable distance. So some students have to relocate and that presents huge barriers in terms of equity. Inclusive environments are those that, that Identify a culture of belonging and actively invite contribution and participation of, by people of every race, identity, and community. And from that same student who shared with me how much she wanted her educational background to be at an HBCU because that was where she found her community, when she did her internship, she was the only person of color in her internship. And she talked about feeling like she did not belong. She didn't look like anybody else on the team. When she started her fellowship, the director was also a person of, a woman of color. And the first day she called me and said, I have found where I fit. Having that representation, even as a child life specialist, is not only essential to the, the patients and families we serve, but to our team. That we need to feel, we, we need our students who come in with as diverse backgrounds being able to say, I look like others that are here. I sound like others that are here. And those inclusive elements are really essential. Now, this is kind of old, and I apologize, it was the, the most recent that I could find. 2018, the ACLB did a member survey, and what came back was that our field is 99% female and 91% Caucasian. So we know we do not have a diverse field, while they did repeat the study or the survey in 2021, and I've seen some of the numbers, it wasn't quite as complete, but I think we are now at 89% Caucasian. So we're making a little bit of a difference, but we really aren't seeing re true representation within our field. And representation will also bring more representation, continue to diversify the field, and we just simply are lacking. And I think a big part of that is the barriers that students are facing what we were seeing with, with this study primarily was students who were, um, again, the Caucasian, we see the, the income is middle to upper class. These are typically students that have financial support from families. And 
cultural differences mean that not every family is going to be able to support, not every family is in their culture to support their student. And we have a lot of students that are second career or career changers who don't have those family supports. And so being able to change these numbers really means identifying what the barriers are and how we can impact change so that we see that these numbers change as drastically as they need to. Now, there's two different categories of students. And the one that I've always known to be true is the traditional student, who is anywhere from 17 to 25, who goes into college right out of high school, who hears about child life. They complete all of their coursework either as an undergrad or they go into a graduate program for child life. These are typically the, the students who have the financial support of their families. Most of, or actually all of the original child life academic programs were private, which meant that there was a huge financial cost to go to those universities. Whereas now we're starting to see more of the state universities offering child life programs. And so we're seeing the cost of education coming down. And that's also changing the face of what students look like. So instead of just having the traditional who are incredible students, we now have contemporary students. The contemporary can include anyone from career changers to those students that are over 25 who may have either started families or started a career and come back to school and are now looking at a career in child life. These students have very different needs and typically don't have the financial support that the traditional students have. And so there's a big difference in who is coming into the field, even in terms of who is looking for education. So some of what guides the work that I'm personally doing, I am looking at research and collecting data to better understand what those barriers are for students. Um, but the first is critical pedagogy, which questions the norms, beliefs, and take it for granted assumptions and the status quo in teaching and learning. So the idea that whatever has been working should still work because it's what we've always done. And what we've always done isn't necessarily focusing on those contemporary students. It's assuming that everybody is still traditional and has the financial support to move forward and therefore why change it. But we know that those aren't correct assumptions. We know that funds of knowledge play a really important part in determining how we move forward and who comes into the field. Funds of knowledge is the idea that we uh, integrate lived experiences. And this is important both in the community and in the hospital. And when I say lived experiences, probably half of the child life specialists that I've known were introduced to the field as pediatric patients and knew what child life was because they were able to receive support from a child life specialist during their own medical care and have determined that now this is what they want to do. Now, personally, I didn't discover the field until 23 when I had the medical diagnosis. I didn't get child life support, but I knew that there was something that I could bring to pediatric patients. I didn't know what that was. And I sort of stumbled into child life as a result. But those lived experiences are really invaluable. And whether we're looking at medical care or previous career, the number of folks that started in teaching and found their way to child life. I think is huge and they bring such important pieces of knowledge with them into the field and how they they give us the, or they, how they provide interventions and how they interact with children and families. So many different fields are now finding their way into child life. And I think those funds of knowledge are really essential in how we build our, our programs, how we build what we can provide and how we really impact the children and families in need. The other idea is transformative worldview, which is focusing on the need for social change, rebuilding the identity of the field of child life to meet the needs of children and families. So we know, again, having switched from all to traditional students to now incorporating traditional and contemporary, there's a need for change because what was being done simply isn't working. We know we have more jobs in the field than we've ever seen unfilled and we have fewer internships to complete to then fill those jobs. Something has to change. And so that's what we want to look at is how we can incorporate change in a positive way to really be able to impact the students so that they can fill those jobs and meet the needs of children and families. So what are the goals of DEI in child life, or at least my goals, and bear with me for one sec, to gain greater insight into the impact of DEI, 
in the field of child life with the focus on exploring how we as a field can help to overcome barriers students are facing when they're trying to access specifically the child life clinical requirements, but all of the requirements needed to pursue certification. So there's two studies, and I'm hoping everybody here has either read these or goes and checks them out there on the ACLP's website for the Journal of Child Life. The first is we're going through tough times right now, how students of color navigate the field of child life. And what was identified in this study was that the barriers that students were facing were financial, that they were having challenges accessing internships, and that certification-related barriers were preventing them from moving forward. And again, we talked a little bit about the feeling of isolation, uh, fitting one's marginalized identity into their child life identity, but also folks that are single parents or parents of young children, and health issues that may limit the ability to complete a full-time internship, knowing that there are part-time jobs, that we're not quite matching up what student needs are to what the field needs are. The second study, and this one is very near and dear to my heart, I am one of the at all authors on this particular study, uh, but being a child life student has definitely been difficult. And here we found that students, again, needed financial support, that mentorship was an essential component of students being successful in completing both academic and clinical experiences, that students needed access to information and resources, that the website for the ACLP is not always as user-friendly as we'd like. And again, right now, there's a lot of broken links with the new website being developed, but there's simply a lot of holes in or gaps in what information is available to students and where it's available and what is trustworthy information. So there needs to be more out there that is reliable information for students. We also need to create a sense of community. And that is something that I think we've started to do in various spaces, but I still think hearing from students who are in internships and still feel isolated. We need to have more community for students at every step of the, the process. It's a crazy process. And I know most of you know that. So how can we as a field minimize barriers to accessing clinical internship requirements? And to start us off, what I'm what I've done is I've invited, we've got two who are here right now, two incredible child life specialists who are who have created a program that minimizes barriers for students in their location. And rather than step on toes, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have you introduce yourself. I've got the questions that I sent to each of you, uh, but I'm going to start with you, Katrina. If you want to talk to us about your program, I'm just calling this stipend exploration. But if you want to take it from here, I'd love to turn the floor over to you. Thank you so much. My name is Katrina Fro, and I am the student program coordinator at Helen DeVos Children's Hospital, which is part of Corwell Health uh, in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And we are uh, about a mid-sized program. We take usually take about three interns per semester. And I cannot take any credit for what I'm going to talk about because I was not the student program coordinator at the time. Um, but what we have developed is we have a diversity, equity, and inclusion scholarship that our interns can apply to uh, at the same time that they apply for our internship. Um, it is a $6,000 scholarship and they receive $3,000 at the very beginning of their internship and $3,000 at the end. Uh, it was developed by one of our former child life specialists, China Petty, and I believe we were the first program to begin to offer this. So she saw the need um, probably before kind of the whole world started to talk a lot more about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and it started to be talked about a lot in healthcare. ACLP started to talk about it a lot. Um, so we're, we're really, really proud um, of our scholarship. Uh, it is a essay that um, anyone that wants to apply can submit an essay and the essays are scored and then scholarships are delivered that way. Um, we have also in, um, offer a part-time internship in the spring for anyone that needs to work part-time um, and then it would just stretch, stretch more into the summer. So for people that might have a family or even with a scholarship can't afford to, to not work. Um, and then we really are 
constantly thinking about other ways to help, you know, housing assistance, paid internships. Um, so we really, we, we know that there's more that we can do, but we think we've got a pretty good start. We also really try to connect our students with what our system calls these business resource groups. Um, and we have groups for LGBTQ plus community. We have groups for Hispanic uh, members of our community and in our um, organization. We have all sorts of different groups that someone might feel a connection to in there. We encourage our interns to get involved with those because we know no matter what, as an intern, it's it's hard. You're, it's lonely, especially if you're moving to a new city and you don't know anyone and your child life specialist um, team is, you know, supposed to kind of keep that professional relationship. It, it, it can be hard. So we really try to ingrain our interns into our, into our system community. Um, so again, all of the credit really goes to our former, in, our former child life specialist, China. Um, we are, I'm really lucky to work for a very large system for well health that really, really took DEI seriously a, a couple of years ago. And our entire system of 65,000 plus people are going through this multi-hour training, cultural bias training, every single person that works for the for the whole system. And plus there's lots of, of course, other different resources and learning opportunities. Um, but I really feel like our organization really puts their money where their mouth is and, and doesn't just talk about this, but really makes it happen, uh, which is really exciting. Our uh, DEI scholarship is funded through our foundation. Our program is uh, philanthropy fun funded for the most part. And so that's where our scholarship comes from. And then uh, this final question here too, if we were creating this program, how might we do things a little bit differently? Um, we are working on making some changes to our scholarship because Although we, we right now we do not ask for any sort of demographics from our interns who are applying. And so we kind of feel like uh, our scholarship maybe is, I don't know, not quite reaching, not quite doing exactly what we want it to do. We think it has great intentions, but we're trying to figure out how we can really reach the people who will bring more representation to the field and, and really need this rather than the people who maybe can write a really great essay and talk about DEI, but maybe, uh, you know, don't, doesn't reach some of those other goals. So that's what we're kind of working on and talking about. Um, I also wanted to mention too, I think I've heard of other sites posting rubrics um, for like what they're looking for in an intern. And I think that that helps too. Other sites are also posting DEI statements. And so uh, we're working on some of those things as well, as well as connecting with some of our more local students for to kind of bring back our practicum and figure out how the how we can best best do that. Um, I think the other thing too, maybe we have started to do something we would do different. We've really started to try to prepare ahead of time for students who bring diversity to the field. So whether that need means they need some sort of accommodation and okay, if a, let's, let's pretend we have an intern who's applied and they have a service dog. Let's start talking about that now before it happens or before a student shows up with a service dog and we're then starting to scramble. So trying to um, make sure that students know that our program values diversity. Uh, they don't need to be nervous about disclosing something to us because I think that, that that's also a, a big issue. And then uh, the last one here, any lessons learned? Uh, I think that if, since I've gotten into this role and started to kind of push, push the boundaries on some of these things, I think I've found that if you get a no from somewhere, there's always another avenue you can try, or especially in such a large organization, there's always somebody else you can, you can talk to. So I think that's just what I've learned is just not to give up some of this kind of stuff. No, I love that. And you have already are obviously investigating some of the things that I hadn't even talked about yet that we're about to get to. I love that your program is doing what you're doing. One of the things that I get a lot of questions about from students is whether or not they should disclose and at what point in the process. And so I love that you bring that up because I've had students where I've heard, I started today and we didn't know what to do because they didn't know my accommodations or I brought my dog to exactly what you just mentioned. At what point in the process do you want to know things like that? 
we want to know as soon as they feel comfortable telling us as soon as possible we want to know because we we would never discriminate against a student because of those things however i do understand that concern of some students where some hospitals would say oh, okay they've got a service dog that's way too much for us to do you know we don't really even allow the therapy dogs in her how would we work with that so i do understand students concerns with those but um yeah i'm trying to figure out the words for our website of saying Please feel free to let us know. We will not discriminate against you because students are also in that, for us at least, they're in that weird kind of space where they're not a volunteer for us and they're not an employee. So really what are there and what are the kind of HR things that, that you know, help support us? Um, but yeah, we're talking through a lot of that right now. I love it. And I think that's a big piece that students need to find where they match. Mm -hmm. And so if a hospital is not receptive, that's probably the wrong placement for them. So I think that's, I love that you're putting that on the website. And if you need someone to bounce ideas around with, I'd love to be part of that conversation. But I think that is huge. And you're, you're covering so many potential barriers. Yeah, yeah. And I, I absolutely agree. I think we're in a, such an interesting time in our field where there are not quite enough internships, but there's lots of jobs. And so I my kind of philosophy on my role and with our interns is, you know, we want, we want you to want to work here. And I think there's, there are, there, you're, you're going to kind of get people who have a bad experience during your internship applications and they have a interview that is not friendly and is not supportive. And then that is going to stick with them. And when they have their choice of jobs, they're not going to pick that program. So that's where I, where I come from. Oh, I love that. Thank you so much. And we're going to keep you here if you don't mind for a little bit. We're going to do a yeah. Q&A at the end because I know that there's other folks that have probably have questions. Um, I'm actually going to let me, whoops, see if I can skip slides here. And Ashley, I'm going to turn rather than flub your introduction, I'm going to let you introduce yourself. And if you want to take on the same questions and then I kind of labeled this the salary employment exploration, but I will give you the floor, Ashley. I like it. So I'm Ashley Oaks. I am the Child Life Manager at Integris Health Children's in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Um, and we have created um, a paid internship experience um, at our site. And so it kind of came about um, trying to figure out ways to help students be able to attend a 15, 16 week internship and how do you afford to be able to come and do those things. Um, entice applications, open it up to more diverse backgrounds of who might be able to come to an internship because it's like you were talking about, Belinda, it's a lot of work to move around and you move around for practicums, internships, jobs. Um, and so we kind of structured it around our, we have um, a nursing program that has kind of different levels that they work their way through, um, starting off with internship, residency, and then they get a job. And so we've been brainstorming a lot, especially as Katrina was talking, there's a lot of jobs open in the field. Um, but maybe not as much internships. So how can we get interns in, prep them for a job, and then hire them on afterwards is, is kind of our goal along the way. And, and again, so that it's available to anyone, especially since it's paid. Um, so I feel like for the barriers meeting, again, I think the biggest thing in our mind was people being able to afford to come down and do a full-time, it's a full-time internship, 40 hours a week, sometimes plus, and then you have homework at home. You can't really work or do anything. So trying to figure out a way that we can support students while they're here. Um, and because of how we went about creating this position, um, it's a paid full-time. So you get 40 hours plus a week, you get overtime if you're here late. Um, and the internship also gets a relocation um, stipend. So they get relocation money to, come to our facility um, and we're pretty open about like our intention is to hopefully you love it here and you want to be hired on afterwards. So you finish your internship and roll straight into a job, um, which at that point you would get a sign on bonus of $10,000 to be able to like finish any of your like relocation, any other things that you would need to be able to move and start a job um, while you're accumulating your others. And so even as an intern, they get full benefits as well. So if they needed insurance or anything like that, um, you get all the perks of being a full-time employee, which I think is fabulous. And I'm super excited about it. Um, as far as funding, our funding, it's funded through our department. Um, so we have taken um, 
one of our positions and turned it into a child life intern. And so we post it on our job board um, following like the ACLP guidelines for offer dates and things like that. Um, like even this upcoming one, we're going to follow those. And then once we accept an intern, then we'll post it and let them apply to it that way. Um, and But it's funded through our department and that's how we kind of filled that so we didn't have to have any like foundation funds or anything. Um, and then it says if you're to create it now, this is brand new. We have our first intern. She started uh, a few weeks ago and she's doing amazing. Um, and so as we go along, I think there's, you know, bumps along the way. I think there was like relocation was offered a little too late when it should have been offered early. So I think there's stuff like that. We're just working out the kinks um, with HR. Um, but she's still getting all the benefits and everything that she would as like a full-time employee in an internship. Um, and I'm still learning my lessons <laughs> as we go along. So I don't have anything in particular on that. Um, I know too, we were talking about, you know, students that may have children. Um, we do have like on-site childcare facilities. They do cost, but hopefully with being paid, like perhaps that could be a benefit because you get a discount for being um, employed by the hospital. Um, I know my kids go there and I love it. So I think there's different opportunity. Um, I definitely wrote down some ideas from Katrina too that I might be exploring with like posting the rubric and the DEI statements um, and some other things that maybe we could implement. So my brain is already stirring as to what other things we can do. And I'm always open to other ideas. And I love that. And I know we're gonna have questions for both of you um, from our participants. I think we're all, all of our brains are spinning there isn't a single way to do this where it's going to impact everybody. So exploring what makes sense in your program is what I hope that everybody walks away from this webinar from, and, you know, just figure out what you can do and what do you have access to and what are those resources. And I love that you were able to convert a position so that this could be paid. I think that is beautiful. I talked to you when you first announced it and I was so excited because we need more more options. And this is one that I haven't seen very many hospitals do yet. Hopefully that's going to change, but I, I would love to hear more as you get further in, but that is great. Absolutely. And then I, oops, I had a third speaker who was not able to join us, but she was kind enough to share with me the PowerPoint that she sends out to students. So I'm just going to walk through. This is Heidi from Marshfield and they have been offering housing for their interns for about 13 years. And so what they have now is a two bedroom that it has two beds in each of the rooms. When they have practicum students, the practicum students get to share a room. And then when they have, they alternate to internships, interns get their own room. And so they have two interns or four practicum students at any given time. It is fully furnished. It comes with everything you can possibly imagine already there. They said that some of this was donated by the hospital, some was donated by the child life team, and then they've had past interns who bought things and then left them there for the next students. Um, the hospital actually owns multiple properties in the area. And so they were given a two bedroom duplex for the purpose of their, their interns are not paid. And therefore, because most of them are coming from out of state, it was essential that they provided them housing. And it comes with, again, you know, everything that you can imagine. It has bikes in the garage that they can use. It's got, you know, outdoor furniture. And I think the bedrooms are huge. But what a great way to support students is to have housing available to them. You know, whether it's a stipend, whether it's housing, it covers the same thing, but it means that it's more manageable for a student. It's less stress and less overwhelming to have to figure out all of the moving parts to securing an internship and knowing that you've got a place to stay. And I've actually had about three different students who've been part of Marshfield's internship program. Everybody has just glowed when they talk about the housing. Um, this was just all of the extra stuff. The only thing they mentioned is you might want to bring a TV if you want one in your bedroom. Otherwise, it has everything there. And so um, at the end, I've got Heidi's email as well as both of your emails for anybody who wants to reach out with questions on these programs. And the one that I didn't have somebody because I didn't know anybody was doing it. And so thank you very much for sharing that with me, Katrina. Um, the part-time versus full-time. And this is something that has become very, also very near and dear to me. 
I know that there are families that are the, are without financial support. I know that there are parents with younger children. But what really jumped out at me was the medical challenges and something that many students face. And because I don't know who here knows my history, I have shared on my student page that I was in the hospital for seven weeks two years ago, had a heart transplant. The students now reach out to me because I've made it public and say, you know, when do I disclose what my needs are? How do I get a part-time internship? Because my doctor says I cannot do 40 hours a week. And that's something that I really, I, I think I've heard my first hospital exploring that in the last few weeks, but you're the first one I know of, or actually the second that I know of who isn't part, you know, you don't have to be a student at a specific university to be able to apply for your part-time. And I wish that more hospitals would offer part-time to have two students part-time completing an internship at the same time takes the same amount of time as one after the other. And so you can still have two students go through the entire experience, but you can accommodate for people who are out wanting to apply for per diem and part-time positions. These are people that are not able to take on full-time for internship and know that the jobs are out there but there are very few internship options. And that's something that I definitely wanna see more hospitals explore. Doesn't mean that all of these fit your program, but something here should fit. And something is worth exploring. Again, this one doesn't cost any money to explore part-time. It means that somebody can continue to work if they need to. It just gives more options. And so I would love to explore other ideas this is one that is actually just piloted and offers were extended this week for the Southeastern ACLP Regional Group. They did a pilot with the goals that included decreasing burden to students, which means they wanted all the students to stay, stay local and they didn't want to have to have them moving across the country. They didn't want them applying. And I hate to say this, I've had students apply to 70 internships. And I know what that means on the other side, the burden to clinical coordinators Nobody wants to review 200 applications and take that time away from patient interactions. And so there's definitely an incentive to this matching idea. They are collecting data as we speak on surveys from the students that participated in this pilot. I, from what I understand, five of these hospitals extended offers to their match and 10 students now have their internship set up for winter spring ahead of when the application window opens for the rest of the, the country. So this one is a study that is actively ongoing and I'm looking forward to hearing more, but I think that it has a lot of promise. It's not all of the hospitals in the region, but it's enough to make an impact for the local universities and the local students. And affiliation is already in place because these are local hospitals and local universities. So another idea that I'm excited to learn more about, but we've got a little bit of time before that study is released. And I know they're, they're actively completing the surveys as we speak. So I would love to hear from all of you uh, participating. What other barriers to access have you heard or have you experienced? And if you want to just add into the chat, I'd love to hear what areas we haven't yet explored and that we should. Um, Belinda, I think we have some, is this a good time to you know, answer questions or should we save that? We can do, I was going to do that at the end, but we're like two slides away from that. So we can do that now if you prefer. I know I'll let you finish. And then we have some good questions, but yeah, that it is a great question in terms of like the barriers for access and clinical internship requirements. Cause you know, I think that is a challenge even for our students at UCSB is getting access to that internship and, you know, just like everything you've mentioned these are barriers that every student faces. And even where there have been matching programs, I know that, um, who is it? Boston College, which was Wheelock, that they have matching for their local hospitals, but student, they don't have enough placements for all of their students. So their students are still applying if they don't get their match. And the I same think it's pilot, but very few universities have this guaranteed match unless the program is physically, or the hospital is at the university or vice versa. That's kind of the only time we see those matches. Uh, Katie has a question, or maybe she has a comment to this question. Go right ahead. I was just going to let you guys know the chat is disabled, so people may have <laughs> things to say, but we aren't able to type those in. But while you're getting those, I did want to share and maybe ask the group, too, 
we've had a couple of students, um, you know, disclose to us a, a learning disability or anxiety, things that we weren't aware of, but became aware of. They shared that with us and we tried to make accommodations, you know, in that kind of quick way and making sure we're responding to them. Um, but we found it challenging within our institution because so many resources are employee specific. And so wanting to have, you know, those community groups um, that were previously talked about or um, ways for those students to get connected. But so many of the resources are specific to employees. So I'm wondering if if anybody on the call who's presented already or if Belinda, if you've um, explored any of those options for students. Um, within CCLIP, we also have started a student reflection. So um, hospitals that are within the SCA CLP, we um, connect all of the interns and the student coordinators at those hospitals are providing that uh, reflection for them virtually three times throughout the semester. But that's really the only opportunity that our team right now has in, in providing that additional support for our students. So I'd love to know more from others. Again, I'm not in hospital, so I will let you folks um, start that conversation and then I'm happy to jump in with what I've experienced and what I know, but go right ahead, Katrina. Yeah, I can share. Um, one thing we have had a lot of success with um, is uh, connecting our child life interns with, because most of them lately, I would say the past four semesters, all of them have been from out of state. And so they don't know anyone here. And so we have connected them with the local university's child life department and those child life students. So like their child life club or something and said, these are people who get what you're going through, who probably could learn from you uh, and you guys can actually hang out. So that's been really successful. And then I think that, but the number one thing, which it sounds like you are doing something similar, we try our very, very best to have our child life interns like get really close together as a group. Um, I think on that first day, we try to say, you know, I, you know, you're all, you're all here. You've been competing for these internships. You all deserve to be here. It's no longer a competition. We are not comparing you because we have had that in the past where some, for some reason, those interns feel like it's, they still need to compete against each other. But we say, you guys are your biggest support system. And so far in my time as supervisor, we have, the, our interns have become so close and been there, been the best support for each other. We kind of build that into their schedule a little bit too. And every once a week we schedule, we call it a student lunch and learn. Um, and they get a little confused by that because they feel like they need to be doing something, but really it's a time for our child life students. And then also if we have music therapy interns or any other kind of interns in our department, they get together for an hour, they have lunch together, they just get to chat about what they've seen, what they're going through. And so it's something that's in their schedule. So it can't be like, oh, you you, you can just get that today. You know, you don't have to get lunch with your intern. Um, they're, they're expected to do that. So that's been successful. But since our merger, I don't really know why that had an impact on this, but our interns have a lot more uh, available or a lot more available to them that was previously only available to employees, including this thing called U Alliance. I don't, and it's not, it's a separate entity. It's not part of our something, you know, some sort of group that we've contracted with. And that it even includes eight free therapy sessions with like a licensed therapist. So they can take advantage of a lot of those types of things too, which I know you said most of your, of your things are, are not available, but those have been successful for us. And I don't, Ashley, I'm not sure if you're talking because you're on mute. Um, I, I feel like I don't have a bunch of that. I don't know if this is helpful. I was going to say we have different um, things that are available to employees, but because the internship is an employee, they would have access to um, those things such as, you know, free counseling sessions and some of the different groups that we have around the hospital. Um, I know that's not super helpful for people that aren't part of it, um, but I think that's another benefit to replacing one of our positions with the child life internship. Um, so sorry, I don't have other extras to add, but I think that is a, a perk of making them part of the department. No, I think those are all such really important pieces. I love the idea of adding in DEI and what that includes so that students know, 
requesting accommodations when they accept or disclosing when they apply is something that you can manage before the student gets there. And I had a, a student that I was familiar with this particular scenario, secured a practicum, showed up the first day in a wheelchair that didn't fit into the spaces of the unit that she was assigned. And so they had to drop everything and restructure a practicum as the student was physically there. You know, encouraging students to disclose this type of information in advance so that we can plan for it and we can accommodate, we can accommodate for pretty much everything, but not knowing is really hard to accommodate. Knowing that we have resources like counseling that, you know, I love when programs have more than one intern and I know this is a hardship for some programs, but if you can accommodate and have more than one intern at a time, they've got an instant network and community. Whereas students who are there on their own, especially when it's the only hospital in the region, that on its own is can be really isolating. And so, you know, finding where the other interns are from other departments, I think that's huge also. Giving them a, you know, giving them a space with the local university, I think is incredible. What are the other resources that you can tap into? You know, and every community is going to be different. So you don't know what everybody has, but you all know what's in your your area. And again, happy to bounce ideas around with anybody who'd like to. But I think disclosing with the application that you are receptive and open to any and all applications and that you're willing to accommodate or you're willing to find what needs to be modified to make every student successful. I think that's huge. And I think a lot of students would welcome something that discloses that type of energy. And I know that you said there were more questions that were waiting, Sunny. If you want, we can tackle those now or. Awesome. Yes, I think we have uh, two. Well, we have a lot of comments. Also, as you answer these first two questions, Melinda, I'll go through the comments as well. But um, we got a question from Katie who said, thank you for sharing, Katrina. I am curious how you navigate encouraging students to engage with the community. Our team has struggled since those groups connections are employees instead of students. Any suggestions are appreciated. So it seems like it's a question for our guest speaker. Yeah, I think that's what kind of what Katie had just asked. So I, I think we kind of covered it, but I did think of one more thing. Um, the the other thing we are doing that's new this year is we have a teddy bear clinic led by one of our local uh, local universities and it's all their med students. And so I think uh, we, we have our interns scheduled to attend that and help with the child life booth. So that is almost day, I think it's week two that they're here. So ho we hope that they can maybe make some connections there too. And I think that'll be a really good experience for them because it's it's going to be hundreds of kids. So it's just one, one interaction after the other. We have another question for Miranda. How many paid internships are there in the U.S.? And I'm going Oh, from her, um, I personally know of two, and you've heard from one. Driscoll is in Texas. That is the other that I am familiar with. Has anybody heard of others that are doing this? I'm hoping we're going to see this number increase, but does anybody know of more? I'm wondering if Driscoll is the one that I'm thinking of. I can't remember who said it, but I bet it was because I feel like it was on more of a regional local thing close to Oklahoma, which would include Texas, um, that was talking about their paid internship opportunity, which sparked my brain to go down this other path and talk more about what our nurses do. So I'm assuming that's probably the same one. Yeah. So as far as we know, there are two, but but there are others that do housing. There are others that do stipends. There are different ways of getting to that same goal. Yes. Yeah, at the moment, too. Students said Tennessee has a paid residency program. Um, that is a six month internship, quote unquote, internship. OK, is that East Tennessee or do you happen to know? I'm not sure who that was. Le Bonheur? Looks like oh, it's Le yes. Bonheur. Yes, uh, but they are now part of the regional pilot, which means the only people who can apply have to be in the Southeast ACLP regional group. So yes, I, I'm sorry, I did know that one, but it's not open to everybody. But I have a student who is there right now who is loving it, and I'm sad that it's not open to more students, but we'll see where the pilot leads. Perfect. Um, I don't think we have any other questions, Melinda. Okay, whoops. And I just want to make sure I got everything. Okay, so if you've gone through that, then we are set. Let me close that. So, oops, 
And I'd just love to explore what other program ideas are you hoping to explore to better impact DEI through your program? And this is a question to our participants. And I think the chat is now working if anybody wants to throw ideas out or jump into the call. And I think so much has come up from just our conversation that I'm excited to see what and what we explore moving forward. And what resources do I know for supervisors? There is There are a couple of programs. The ACLP does have a mentorship program that includes if you want support as a supervisor, and as long well, supervisors must have been in the field for at least a year, so they would be eligible for the mentorship program. Child Life on Call also does a mentorship program, which is absolutely fabulous. And they've got, as to the last time I spoke with them, they had two supervisors who both are absolutely incredible and are guiding on leadership skills, supervisory input, um, recommendations. So those are definitely ideas that that are, I would recommend either of those. I'm sure there are others that do similar work, but those are the two that, that come to mind. But maybe we need a, a, a group that is, you know, like the Facebook group for students, maybe we need something for supervisors where we can just jump into those conversations. I have seen some on the Certified Child Life Specialist page. Oh, and I was going to add something. Christy, you had mentioned something about having a student in a chair. And one of the ideas that, sorry, I'm pulling you out of the crowd here, Christy. We had piloted this um, when Christy had a student at the beginning of the pandemic where we, we were working with robots. And the robots were going into the rooms because we couldn't bring students into the rooms. And then we had a medically fragile intern who was working with Christy. And so I, the, it was what, I, and I'm probably putting words into your mouth, but I believe it was an iPod on a pole that they dressed in clothes so that it looked like it was a person and it was the face of the intern. There are ways to accommodate pretty much any challenge. It's not always ideal. And the hospital may not be the best, or that unit may not be the best setting for that student as a child life specialist. But as long as the students are needing an internship, it has to be, at least most of it has to be in a hospital setting. So we need to find ways to accommodate whatever the needs are. And yes, thank you for adding that. She did have some hours in person at the end. And actually you were the second hospital I worked with who did the robot and it was um, Advent Health in Orlando that was the first. Robots can absolutely be used when we can't accommodate bringing a, a, an intern into a space. And that's another great way to accommodate. But again, we need to know those in advance because it's a lot of work. And I know Christy can vouch for this. There's a lot of work that goes into it on the supervisor side when the student isn't in person. But that's another way to hopefully accommodate for somebody who has those physical limitations and the unit isn't set up to accommodate that. Well, Linda, this isn't necessarily I guess student related, but I was, you know, talking about the supervisor and the supervisor support, um, which is something we tap into like the ACLP's um, support network that they have for supervisors. Um, but I feel like on the flip side that it does take so much time for supervisors, something that we've implemented too is like our supervisors do get preceptor pay for being with um, students. So something too, you know, as you go from your paid internship or internship experience to wanting to help other students that it's another way to help them because it does take a lot of time. But then we also fund some of those opportunities for like, you know, the mentor programs and things like that to up their skills as well. But I was just seeing that it does take a lot of time. So um, that's just something that we offer that I really like. And I love that. And I've had more hospitals reach out and say, how do you get supervisors to supervise? We don't have enough. We have qualified, but we don't have enough. How do, how do you fund having a stipend for those supervisors, if you don't mind me asking? Sure. So um, ours, we've actually got approved. Um, we use we use Kronos as a way that we like track all of our time and stuff in the hospital. Um, but so I've submitted like an SBAR to be able to get supervisor pay. So they clock in and out as they normally would. Um, and then submit approvals um, for their preceptor. So within our time cards, I can go in and add like their lead preceptor pay. And so they're automatically for every hours they had the intern, they get this these extra dollars on top. So it's all just kind of part of our, not necessarily a stipend, 
Um, but I've really, really dove into like, what are the nurses and what are the other clinical providers getting and what kinds of things are they benefiting from and how come we can't benefit from it too? And so I feel like Katrina was talking about this earlier, but there's always other avenues. And if I got told no one way, I kind of go a different way and ask. Um, and so I'm kind of a squeaky wheel around here that if I want something, if you tell me no, I'm just going to try to find another way to do it. And so um, that's ours is integrated into the system. Um, so we have like, we have a clinical ladder too. So like our leads get paid and then our preceptors can get preceptor pay. Um, so really just trying to find anything that it just takes so much of their time and they're pouring out even more than they would just on a regular clinical day. So I was really speaking to that in a sense of that they're, they're, they're going way above and beyond and they're pouring into our future. So let's benefit them because they're benefiting hopefully our future employees um, and our profession around the world. So. No, and such an important focus. And I hope that more programs try because you've got absolutely nothing to lose by asking. And there's all, you know, most of us have foundations that we can go to. Most of our communities have donors that are, would love to benefit pediatric patients. How can we do that? By bringing in more interns and funding supervisors and doing all of these things. These are things that so many funders want to be part of, but they need the connection to be made through the foundation. And yeah, that there is money out there to do those things. We had a similar, uh thing happened. Yeah. We, nobody else in our entire system of 65,000 people had uh, preceptor pay nurses, nobody else. And so I was like, well, that's probably going to be a no if nobody else does. So we took, we went to the clinical ladder route and now have, are starting to integrate that into our, into our clinical ladder. So hopefully that, that works out too. Um, I also wanted to mention, I'm a part of the ACLP internship excellence task force. So we are looking at how do we kind of bring back accreditation in a way that is inclusive of all programs and cost effective and, and all of those things? And or I guess the question really is, do we bring that back? And but part of what we've been talking about is preceptors and how to best support them, not necessarily with pay because we don't have any control over that, but with training and is there training for all preceptors and, and recognition. So that that'll be coming at some point, too. And I know I'm just reading some of the comments and people who have tried to get preceptor pay. And, you know, maybe it's a matter of changing the clinical ladders and adding in preceptorship as part of one of those ladder ranks and incorporating that pay into that so that it's not separate. But I think there, there are definitely ways around that. It's just a matter of getting creative and then finding the one that you get the yes on. But don't give up. And some of this went quickly. If I missed something, Sunny, please tell me what I missed. Nope, I think that does it. Um, I think that wraps it up unless you, ha you have anything more to share, Belinda. But this was very informative. And I think you're truly an innovator in really paving the way for child life and helping child life, the field of child life, really expand in becoming more diverse um, and equitable to everyone who wants to join this amazing, amazing field. So... 